Come along with us as we explore the broad world of preservation and the work being done to preserve, interpret, and save our past in a 21st century world. From aquaculture to historic foodways to forensic modeling, we're talking weekly with experts from across the globe. This is your host, Nick Redding. Welcome to PreserveCast. On this week's PreserveCast, join us as we talk with Dr. Roland Parta Cooper about Exarc, a global network of professionals active in archaeological open air museums and experimental archaeology, ancient technology, and interpretation. Dr. Parta Cooper will talk us through this unique field of study and how you too can learn traditional skills by engaging with Exarc. This is Nick Redding. You're listening to PreserveCast. And today we're excited to be joined by a friend from all the way across the pond. We're talking with Dr. Roland Parta Cooper about Exarc. And we're going to learn all about what that is and uh, the kind of interesting experimental archaeology that is being done. Um, and uh, we're going to learn all about that. But before we get there, we love to get to know folks um, and understand sort of their path to these unique um, uh professions in the field of preservation and archaeology and all the different folks that we talk to. So, um, Roland, tell us a little bit about yourself. Um, where are you from? Where did you grow up? And what was sort of that moment when you realized you, you wanted to work in this kind of unique field? What led you to history, archaeology, preservation, all that good stuff? Well, thanks for letting me join. Uh, and I come from Holland, from, from the Netherlands. Uh, a city called Eindhoven, which is, let's say, an industrial town developed towards right now high tech. Uh, originally, it were was a Philips factories in the 30s, 40s, 50s, but now it's very much uh, much more high tech. That city is a bit of a problem because the history is not visible. Or its uh, origin is from the 13th century already, but if you want to see something, you have to go underground. And and when I grew up there, I realized, well, underground, that means uh, archaeology. So um, that's a lot uh, of, of what I did in my high school years, spending time at, at excavations in, in the local town. Um, there was a kind of a young archaeologist club, if you can call it that way. And, and uh, besides that, when I was about 12 years old, a group of school teachers uh, started to build uh, what I would call a prehistoric village right next to my high school. So that was interesting for me. Of course, I skipped more classes than I should. Uh, Spending time there, uh, chopping wood, sitting around a fire, all kind of games you want to play as a a kid. And um, that became more structured, so to say, that outdoor life with a little bit of the stories of the past of of, of that area. So there was this youth, young archaeologist club and we met every month for a whole weekend in those prehistoric houses, so to say. We had summer camps there. And uh, I did that besides of the archaeology uh, in town every, every now and then, mainly in the weekends. And I was so interested in archaeology about being able to tell the story of the past, of the people who lived in that area 400 years ago or 1,000 years ago, and, and also trying to understand ourselves. But I thought, well, you know, I must make it more serious so i decided to study archaeology in in leiden and then i soon found out that uh, this what we call experimental archaeology was not something we did just there in holland sitting around the campfire and, and and reconstructing things but it happened also in the countries around us and this was mainly through older students who who had the contacts already and at a certain moment, there was a conference, I remember, in, in Germany, and we decided with a few friends, let's take a train, let's go there. Uh, so we went there, and it was so much, so interesting, but also so fun. And to, it was nice to see people from a very different background, but with exactly the same interests as, as we had. So uh, we decided to go back to that conference every year. And and experimental archaeology is is very much very practical, I would say. It also requires uh, thinking. And, and that's what I like so much. It's hands-on and minds-on. And, and at one of these annual conferences, uh, a guy approached me with a very typical German name. His name is Martin Schmidt. And he asked me, well, 
Roland, do you see all these experiments which are presented here in these two days? How much of that is actually done in, in archaeological open air museums? And why isn't there a network for, for these places? Because there's so much more happening in these places. They're very diverse, but we may talk about that later. Um, why isn't there a network for, for, for those people? So uh, I said, well, as a student, I said, well, I would like to, to, to help with that. It would be interesting to also get some more international contacts. So he had some contacts. We sent letters. Uh, I mean, this was in the time uh, before email. And a few months later, we met with about 20 people in Martin's Museum in Germany. And that's roughly how that started about uh, 25 years ago. And so it, we're going to talk about Exarc, but what is your, people might be curious, what was like your first job in the field, like your first paid job? Was it doing experimental archaeology? Was it just doing archaeology, like actually opening up and excavating things? Um, and how are you professionally employed at this point? Well, I studied archaeology basically not to, I mean, I liked excavations because that's your first hand in contact with something which hasn't been shown an, uh, since hundreds of years. So it's a very direct contact with, with the people who lived there before. Um, but my first job in the field was actually back to the place where, where I was uh, playing in my, in my childhood. When I was studying archaeology in Leiden, I still kept contact with that prehistoric village in Eindhoven. And in a certain moment, I said, well, would you mind helping us writing a project application about how could we, as, as a prehistoric village, uh, start with experimental archaeology? And, and, and basically, I, I replied to them the same thought we had with the whole of Exarch ideas about this is about getting those museums more professional. Because if they're more professional, more structured, then they can uh, actually do these experiments. Uh, so I wrote an application for a three-year project. I was still living in Leiden. And then the project got accepted. And they said, well, now you have to come over to do that project. So, oh, okay. I, I actually didn't see that coming. Maybe maybe I was too young uh, to, to, to think about it. But um, so my first job was in that prehistoric village. I, I spent there about three years doing all kinds of things. I mean, th those are small places and everybody has 10 jobs at the same time. Even the director has a, has a lot of different jobs. So during that time, I was also still working with uh, with Exarch, which was not that large yet by then. And, and when the third year came to an end, so to say, it was only a project of three years, um, we started a European cooperation project uh, funded by the European Union with uh, eight museums in eight different countries. And, and, and that was quite a challenge, but I left uh, the prehistoric village and started managing that project. And I also used those eight museums for my PhD because I thought, well, it's nice to work actually practically in the field of museums, uh, but I would also like to do a bit more structured research. So I did a PhD uh, at the University of Exeter and that's indeed not so much archaeology like digging archaeology. I think I haven't been digging uh, since I since I finished my my MA studies in uh, in line. I have not been uh, responsible at an excavation whatsoever since uh, since a long long time because I find it much more interesting to help telling the stories about the past. I mean, let let the the, the professionals excavate and and get the stuff out of the ground. But I would so much more like to be on the on the on the let's say the edge between. The, the science on the one hand and the public on the other hand, how do we explain one to the other? That's, uh, that, that's, that's where I feel uh, my role is more. So that's a, probably a good segue to talk about Exarc. So all of this work is kind of happening. You said I, a good, good way of context, pre-email days. Um, so yeah. there, you can do some experimental archaeology. Maybe you could teach people how to, how to write a letter. That could be a, a new version of experimental archaeology pre-email. They'd have to learn that skill. Um, and, uh, so this is, that's when this is happening. What is Exarch today? Um, and could someone in the United States listening who is like, oh, this is really cool. I'd love to know more about this or get engaged in this. Are there ways for people around the world to get engaged? So tell us a little bit about what Exarch is, what you do now, now that it's kind of grown. Um, and then maybe we can talk about how people can get engaged in the work. Sure. Um, Exarch is mainly a network. So um, it, it's about uh, 450 members, I think, in 40 countries. 
uh, although we say ex -arch experimental archaeology, it's not only that. I, I, I told you before, we start with archaeological open air museums, and they didn't have any structure or network behind them. So it's experimental archaeology, open air museums, ancient technology, and, and also interpretation. And interpretation, I mean, in all senses. That's uh, school groups coming to, to a museum, it's uh, living history. It's uh, live interpretation, etc. So we have those four themes. And I see that there's a cloud of people interested in roughly the same thing, telling stories based on the archaeological past to, to, to the people now. And what I like so much about Exarch, it brings to people together with very mixed backgrounds. I mean, we just had a conference in uh, in Poland where, where we had 60 people and there's professors uh, having a chat with a local blacksmith uh yeah. all kind of people with different backgrounds uh artists also so you don't need to be an academic to be part of that kind of ideas uh, to work with that things um our network is also um, not just those conferences which we organize most of them are also online but also we have an online journal which uh, which is very popular and uh, as i said if i said we have about 450 members i think about 10 percent so 40 45 are individuals from North America. So um, although many of us are in Europe, um, we have people all around the world. At the, at the latest conference, we had uh, somebody from India, somebody from Kazakhstan, uh, you name it, uh, they're involved one way or the other. So if people are listening, talk to us about the kind of information sharing that happens here and the kind of information that um, people learn as being part of the network. Um, and then maybe we can talk about like a specific, because we've kind of danced around a little bit like what the experimental archaeology is. Maybe we can give a, a specific example. But for first, you know, when they convene or when they get the journal, what kind of information sharing is actually happening? Like what are the, what are the details of that kind of work? Yeah, well, I usually try to say to, 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 to new members, look, it's a big network, but you have to push the button yourself. Um, we have uh, a lot of members in, in different themes. Um, if somebody asks a question like, um, how is it with uh, weaving uh, medieval costumes uh, in Poland? Or how is it, uh, how do I get uh, the right stone to, to make stone tools in, uh, uh, in uh, North Canada or whatsoever? Then we usually know people or we know people who know people who can answer those questions. It's it's become too big that I can answer everything myself, but we have uh, all our members on our website, for example, and, and you can say, okay, I want to have everybody in uh, in a row who has worked with jewelry, for example, or with uh, making shoes, or it's a lot of those practical themes which are involved and also about, okay, how can I get Amber from uh, the Baltic states? Uh, we know people who, who know people. Uh, and, and the easy thing is indeed just ask a question. And we probably be able, if it fits within those themes, which I mentioned before, we can answer those questions or, or we can help you getting further. Besides the 450 members, we also have a lot of people on our, on our social media uh, who also are very happy uh, to answer. And if I, it's very open access. And with that, I mean, you don't need to be member to use the facilities, to use the, the network, so to say. If you become a member, you do that because you support the idea. So maybe this is a good place to take a quick break, come back, and let's talk about a couple specific projects. And like, you know, we kind of touched on, you know, weaving or stone tools or things like that. But maybe we can touch on not only how some of this uh, experimental archaeology has worked, but perhaps a situation where, we learned something that we couldn't have learned otherwise from excavation. Um, and we'll do that right here on PreserveCast. Historic preservation can't happen without skilled tradespeople to perform the work. And there's a critical need right now for those tradespeople. The Campaign for Historic Trades, powered by Preservation Maryland, is working to meet that need by strengthening apprenticeship opportunities within historic trades. In partnership with the National Park Service's Historic Preservation Training Center, and Conservation Legacy, the campaign is currently recruiting for NPS Traditional Trades Apprenticeship Program, or TTAP. TTAP is an intensive 20-week apprenticeship that provides young adults the chance to learn historic trade skills while working on America's most iconic historic sites. 
Multiple positions are open for the 2022 season at national parks across the country. Visit historictrades.org for more information on TTAP and how to apply today. This is Nick Redding. You're listening to PreserveCast. Today, we're excited to be talking with Dr. Roland Pardo Cooper. Um, and we've been talking all about Exarch, um, this amazing network of individuals, organizations, professionals working in, the, in the, this um, exciting field of experimental archaeology. And we talked a little bit about how um, Roland got involved in this work, the development of Exarch, and sort of the expansion of this and this sort of open sharing of information around this and how it differs from um, traditional archaeology where you're excavating, this is where you're trying to actually figure out how people did the 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 things that they did back in in historic and prehistoric times. So maybe for people listening who like aren't super familiar with this, we've kind of talked about it sort of in broader terms. Give us an example, if you could, or like a fun example of a situation where experimental archaeology not only kind of physically played out like something that you did, but perhaps a situation where, and I'm sure this happens all the time, where you learned something or gleaned something from a situation that couldn't otherwise have been done just through the excavation process. Because I imagine that that happens quite a bit where it's like, oh, this is how they did it. We just never figured this out. We never would have been able to do this unless we did it ourselves. Yeah, well, let me start by saying that I didn't do many experiments by myself. I know how it works, and I, I'm right. more a facilitator. Uh, oh, sure. Uh, I'm curious <laughs> about something that just even happened in the network that that you guys, you know, kind of um, facilitated, though. Yeah, well, uh, there are examples like, I mean, experimental archaeology is actually um, very, th very theoretically, it's you create a process which is similar to a process from the past. You try to come as close as possible to something what happened in archaeological past. Uh, you can call it an analogy. And, and, and then you want to compare data. So the reconstruction, if you make something like a shoe, for example, the, the shoe itself is not the experiment, but the activity of making it. Or, for example, uh, also interesting, the, the activity of using it. Because you can see an experiment is, can be about producing something, using it or discarding it or even excavating it. So the whole process, the whole life of, of, of an, of an artifact. And, and I would also like to mention we, we are concentrating on artifacts with archaeology, but in the end, we are looking at the people behind those artifacts. Right. But there are, for example, uh, experiments where people made shoes, like for example, how the Romans did it and used these shoes to walk, uh, for days or for weeks or sometimes for, for, for longer than that. And then you can see how these shoes are, are, are worn down. And those, those signs of wear can then be compared to archaeological wear. And that's, uh, that's very interesting. And then you can, you can recognize things in the archaeological artifact, in the archaeological shoe, which you wouldn't otherwise have recognized because you did you don't know how these traces were made how how that rope was was used or or, or what or, or whatsoever for people listening who are saying and and this this question comes up with sort of traditional archaeology i'm sure it comes up sometimes with experimental i'm curious what your thoughts are on this as people say perhaps someone who's not just enamored with it in general say okay so what so we know how a roman shoe was worn down what does that mean to and what is the sort of the relevance of this work to the world that we live in today? Is there a, a thread of sustainability here? Is there sort of relearning traditional skills that could um, be brought back? Is there what how does this impact our modern world? And I'm sure that that's a conversation that's had, particularly as you know, museums make the case for their relevance. How do you sort of see that play out? What are people kind of, how does this tie back into the world that we live in today? Well, I, I think it's making archaeology more relevant indeed to, 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 to the present day. Uh, you have to compare things from now to, to, to the past. The good thing about archaeology is that it looks further beyond the one, two, three years we are, we are experiencing now. It's looking beyond generations. So you, you can make a much longer story, so to say. You can see how people used things in the past and how we can get ideas from that uh, for, for the present. So um, 
it's it, it, simple things like uh, construction methods. Uh, using uh, Wortland dope, for example, is is a traditional technique uh, in, in many places in the world. Also, mud brick is a traditional technique, and uh, we know they use that for thousands of years uh, all across. But uh, it's now kind of rediscovered. Like, hey, this is maybe a a, a method of construction which doesn't have such a big impact on 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 the environment. It's uh, very solid, solid enough uh, for, for 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 our purposes. And this is something what where we can learn from from archaeology and also from experimental archaeology uh, that actually there are techniques which which uh, which we may have forgotten a bit, uh, which have and you I mean with mud brick and so you use often local materials. Uh, Something else, also wooden construction. Uh, in in many countries, say uh, ah, wooden construction. You cannot calculate that so well, like steel or concrete or so. But actually, wooden construction have a lot of advantages. Uh, uh, also, in areas where where there are much more hurricanes, uh, for example, than than where I am here in Europe. When uh, when we realize, okay, it's not so old fashioned to make to use you uh, to use uh, wooden constructions because actually. It it can save you. It's better that a piece of wood falls than than a concrete building falls on top of you. So uh, and it's more flexible as well. So our ancestors have not been that stupid. Uh, I would say they're just as stupid and just as smart as we are. Uh, but they were fit for their circumstances, and we are fit for our circumstances. Um, I'm curious. Are there any experimental archaeology situations that? Um the field has just not been able to figure out yet. Like, how on earth did they do this? We just simply still cannot figure this out, where it's sort of the experiment is ongoing and they can't they can't come to terms with how the ancients did it. Yeah, I have to think a bit. There are certain uh, artifacts. I mean, I remember certain Roman artifacts. I forgot their name. Uh, I have to look that up. Tetraeder or something, which, which, which are found all across the Roman Empire. And nobody knows what they were used for, um, and and that's 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 one of these mysteries mm. where where people in different parts of the world are, are not just in Europe are thinking, okay, how did I make them? Well, we, we that's that's the easy part, but why on earth did they use them? And 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 uh, I think quite recently, um, Roman concrete was, for example, discussed in, in much more detail. And say now we know why the Roman concrete was was working so well, much better than the concrete. After that period, but those, that's, uh, with those Roman objects, um, those metal objects, that's indeed uh, so, something um, which is still a mystery. Fascinating. Um, so, before we kind of draw to a conclusion here, what are you working on at Exarch now? Like, if people are interested in getting engaged, um, what's kind of coming up? Convenings, conferences, things like that. Well, we, we're currently working on on a, a cooperation project with with several open air museums. On um, it's called Retold, and it's about documenting, digitizing, and sharing of the stories of archaeological open air museums, uh, because we believe those stories are very important. And a lot of these those museums are now towards the second generation of people working there. I mean, the first generation is like the founding fathers or founding mothers. And uh, I often use a phrase called Sinatra syndrome or the founder syndrome, that uh, you need a specific kind of people to f- to start an initiative, to start uh, an event or, or a museum like that. But it takes another kind of people to keep it running. And um, that means also a bit more structured work in that documentation and digitization. It sounds boring, but actually... When we are able to, to to digitize, for example, these reconstructed houses all, all across the world uh, and, and put them online, then suddenly we can share a lot more um, stories and, and things uh, for, for, for everybody. So it will be also a tool which every museum uh, in the world could use. So that's what we're working with Exarc itself. That's a bit more like, okay, what's our business? Uh, what are we doing as business right now? Um, we just had a conference on experimental archaeology uh, in Poland and online uh, with uh, with about 9,000 views in, in, in the first two days. We will keep doing conferences on museums every year, every second year, and on experimental archaeology the other year. So 
we expect next year uh, a conference on on museums and the stories they tell, probably in the Netherlands, but also maybe online. We have a journal which is published all the time, uh, every, uh, every three months, uh, which is also online, which everybody can read. Um, and the next experimental archaeology conference will be in 2025. We don't know yet where, but because it's hybrid conference, hybrid conference, it can be anywhere. Mm-hmm. And have uh, just out of curiosity for the American listeners, have you ever done a conference in the U.S.? Not yet, but I have to say that our the XR chair is uh, from Colonial Williamsburg in Virginia, and we are discussing if it would be possible to to uh, to have a joint conference there. Joint a conference, I mean, there's an American organization called ALFAM, mm-hmm. Association of Living History, Farming, and Agricultural Museums. Yep, and and they are sort of our sister organization, I would say. Um, so we are looking into maybe coming to Virginia and having a conference in uh, in William, Colonial Williamsburg together with Alfam at some time. Fantastic. Well, we've done a bunch of Alfam interviews. In fact, we just recently interviewed um, uh, some folks from Colonial Williamsburg about uh, their interaction with Alfam. So people can go back and listen to those episodes. Um, so before we go, we ask everyone to make them squirm a little bit. Your favorite historic place or site? Is there a place that speaks to you? Something that you love? That's, that's difficult to say because uh, if I look at, for example, these open air museums, it's so hard to compare them with each other. Um, and, and what I always say, I mean, I've been a museum director several times, and the task of a museum or historic site towards their visitor is to create an illusion of a perfect past. And, and that should last as long as the visitor is still there. But if you stay a little longer, you see the cracks in the wall, a bit of waste on the floor, all these imperfections. And so I would say there is no perfect place. Uh, some places come pretty close. There's a spectacular place in France called Guédelon, where they're building a 13th century castle. That's a really nice one. And we did have, we had the folks from Guédelon on PreserveCast, so people can go back and listen to that episode as well. Perfect. And as you said, Claudia Willsburg in, in the USA is, is also one of my favorite places because, because the way they do things there is different from other, from other places. Somebody asked, so is this an open air museum? Is it a historic site? Is it, uh, it's, it's everything together, I would say. And, and, um, but people can, can, can look, look that up as well because it's, it's a brilliant site. And the last site I would like to mention is a place here in Denmark. It's called Lyra, Lyra Land of Legends. It's one of the oldest of this kind. And it's it's a park. I mean, they have a, an, a part where there's Iron Age, there's Stone Age, there's also 18th century. And then there's a part where you can just walk around and, and enjoy the, 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 the landscape. So those would be, at this moment, my, my three favorites. Well, we'll have to. Uh, that's the, the the third one there. We have not yet had on Preserves Cast, so we'll have to get an introdu- introduction from you to do that. Um, well, this has been really interesting. We will have links in the show notes to Exarc and all the cool things that you guys are working on, and encourage people here in the United States to take a look and see what folks all around the world are doing in this exciting arena of experimental archaeology. And want to thank you for joining us today. Thanks so much, Roland. Thank you. Thanks for listening to PreserveCast. To dig deeper into this episode's story, head over to PreserveCast.org for show notes and our collection of previous episodes. Don't forget to engage with this podcast by subscribing, commenting, and leaving a review. Follow along on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook at PreserveCast for even more. PreserveCast is currently recorded in Walkersville, Maryland, and sponsored by the 1772 Foundation and powered by Preservation Maryland. Thanks for listening and keep on preserving.